to all of you who are here to hear, uh, to attend this seminar being presented by Stephen Tharney. And you must be wondering why is Rashmi Singla standing here? I am a colleague of Stephen. My name is Rashmi Singla. I am associate professor in psychology and uh, head of the department. Anasi Anasan has give, given me this pleasant task of introducing the speaker of this afternoon. So uh, with uh, pleasure, I will introduce Stephen Carney. Stephen Carney is an associate professor in the department, Department of Psychology and Educational Studies. And uh, uh, his uh, main topic of research is about globalization and education. And uh, when I did some search about uh, introducing Stephen Carney, so the terms written under his name were the dynamics of globalization, inequality, and new processes of international interactions. And these words are not just empty words. His own educational background hmm. uh, is mirroring this uh, globalization. His uh, early education is from Australia, one continent in this big world. And the further education is from Oxford in, uh, in the UK. And later on, he's here in Denmark. And uh, what exactly he is doing, you will be hearing in his presentation. But furthermore, his activities in the department also reflect this global attitude. And uh, this is shown by the research done by him in different countries of the world. And some of his work show that he's done work, empirical work in Nepal, China, and Zambia in different continents of the world. And uh, not only this, at the moment, thanks to his activities and his interest in this uh, world, some of our colleagues from Mumbai in India, welcome and namaskar to our colleagues from Mumbai in India are sitting here because uh, of uh, Stevens and some other colleagues' uh, efforts. Uh, this uh, ongoing uh, exchange with different countries in the world. And lastly, he is uh, also contributing to internationalization for the students and staff in this uh, department. And uh, he's uh, linked along with me, undersigned this course about uh, uh, internationalization. Some of the students are sitting here. Uh, the one semester course in subjectivity and learning, combining psychology and educational studies. With these words, I uh, say welcome to you again, Stephen. And please start, and you will get m many more details about his field of work. Welcome. Okay, thank you, uh, Rashmi. Thank you. Well, I knew, I knew that uh, the audience today would be quite mixed. I knew there'd be some of the academic colleagues, as well as some graduate students, uh, both doing our international candidate or, bad, or master module, as well as some PhD students. Later on, I realized we'd have colleagues from India um, who, will, who will undoubtedly be able to add a little uh, to my discussion of ed education in Asia. And then I learned only last week that one of, the, one of the people that has been foundational in my own understanding of ed education and ethnography, Joseph Tobin, has been here today for a seminar. So as I explained to some of you, I, I madly went away to my office and tried to remake my presentation, <laughs> so that it would, mainly so that it would continue the discussion we had this morning. Um, what I wanted to do is um, to theorize globalization. I think in my field, education policy studies, it's common now for people to talk about globalization or to use globalization as what you could, what you could call an imaginary to think about the current conditions of interconnectivity around the world. But very few people actually um, try to define and theorize it or even further to try and problematize what globalization means in a field like education. So my work is primarily um, theorizing about globalization in order to contribute to my own discipline or sub-discipline, which is comparative education. And when I, in the course of the next 45 minutes or so, I think, I, I hope I'll be able to show you some of the strengths, but also some of the weaknesses of comparative education as a disciplinary approach to understanding globalization. And so this work, the work that I'll present today is, is based on field work and conceptual work I've been doing for many years. Um, and I've written it, I, I wrote it up in a particular way for a, for a journal. And this caused a lot of discussion and debate, some praise and a lot of hostility about the way in which I had tried to reconceptualize comparative education. So without giving you a lot of the detail of the country context, I wanted to just give you a, an idea of how I've been trying to work with uh, the concept of culture 
the concept of action and the, and the concept of the state. State, action, and culture. Three things that are fundamental, I would say, for all educational studies, but are central to policy studies. And the first of those, the nation state, has, has been the primary unit in my own field, comparative education. So before I go into that, um, I'm often asked by colleagues what I do. And, and there's, there's usually only two answers. One, I, I'm the guy who does, does post-structuralism and then it sort of drifts off into a murmur. And the other is I'm the guy who does international things. And, and many of my colleagues have this view of me as working with post, if you could like, post-classical or post-modern theory and rarely being here physically in Denmark, always doing my work elsewhere. But that's not the whole story. Um, and I wanted to, first, before I talk to about, about the actual empirical work, I thought it would be useful to, to give you some of my own origins. Um, as Rashmi said, I've, I've, I came from Australia and worked in Australia, but also, also studied and worked in Britain. And my introduction to education work was through um, Stephen Ball's uh, work on micropolitics in schools which was a symbolic interactionist understanding of teacher dynamics and political culture in a secondary school. That's where I sort of cut my teeth as a, as a budding educational sociologist, very much thinking about the ways in which teachers were subjectivized by management regimes in, in English education. When I came to Denmark, I took a real drop, you could, you could argue, because I started doing work for the Danish Development Agency and started traveling, traveling abroad. That combined with a, lo a, a lot of work on school effectiveness and school development studies, um, which is a, a huge discursive space around how we talk about education. You will all know that as PISA and TIMS, type international assessment studies of education. So I started doing that when I came to Denmark, and that had a very different sociological um, underpinning. But my work in, in Nepal in particular made me very, very, um, aware of a, lot of a lot of global inequalities and the way in which education as a system promised a lot of um, emancipatory potential but actually re tended to reinforce existing social divisions. And because of my, my connection to colleagues in Denmark, I drifted, if, if, if you'd like, into critical theory, but a very Anglo-American version of critical theory, which many people in, in continental Europe and especially in Denmark would not necessarily recognize as critical theory. Then I became much more critical of development as such, and that was my, int my entry to anthropology through development studies. I'm not an anthropologist by any means, and certainly not by training, but it seemed to be that the best critiques, the most pressing critiques of education and social change in the so-called third world were coming from anthropologists in, in a, in a subfield called post-development. Okay, so then I got very interested in the whole area of post-development, which as some of you know has a strong um, post-structuralist or at least a strong Foucauldian inspiration. So this, this journey is actually already, already quite a long one. And, then because, and, and what I'll talk about today is mainly the way in which young people in different parts of the world are negotiating quite different global flows of education policies and practices and along with my colleague Ulla Madsen, we've been studying young people uh, in, in a number of different countries, including Denmark, and trying to understand the ways in which their subjectivities are being remade by involvement in contemporary education. And that's, that's taken me into, I guess, what everybody would agree would be um, postmodern studies of the, of the subject. And uh, I'll talk a little about that later. And then finally, if I have time, after I've presented what I do, I'm going to try and destabilize my own work. I'm actually quite ambivalent about my own work. And so I'm going to try and give you a, a, a way of seeing how a scholar who's sort of, I guess, in his own field, quite well established, could nevertheless then try to unframe or to destabilize the tradition he's working in. And that's, um, that's uh, my, my, my latest turn is to start reading into, into the, the, the philosophy of, of Gilles Deleuze, which is, which is actually a long way from, I guess, Alfred Schultz, where I started, and certainly a long way from a, a, a PISA study. So it's a lot more than just a post-structuralist who's never here. I'm certainly never here. But um, theoretically, it's, I, I'm working in this, this cross field between a very old tradition and field of comparative education, globalization, which is often a proxy or another way to talk about education in different contexts, and then subjectivity, which is a big theme in this department. So um, where do I go when I'm not here? 
there's th uh, at least two main places I go. One has been Nepal, where I've worked for many years. Uh, and this is a scene from a university in central Nepal where Ulla Mazdan and I have been doing development work. Um, th that's another, another story. But I've been working on school, uh, school reform initially in, in urban Kathmandu amongst the poor. Um, this is a typical, a typical inner city school. Levels of development and access to resources and so forth that we simply wouldn't understand in this part of the world. It's very difficult to portray um, how this, this equates to the sort of education we know in this part of the world. That's the only slide that's very dark, but that's, that was meant to give you an, ex uh, an example of what an inner city school in a so-called third world country would look like, the average. Limited lighting, often no heating, often no glass on the windows, very cold in the winters. Dirty, very limited resources, mixed ability and mixed age classes. Many kids have failed and repeated year after year. The condition's quite different to here. This is a school in, in, in rural Nepal, and I picked this one um, mainly because, um, and my PhD student, Nitchit Timsina, would, would be able to say more about that. This was maybe eight or nine years ago. The majority of these children now would be, wor the, the, the males at least, would be working in the Gulf as very low paid um, workers on construction sites. That's what modern education meant for them. And the global flows that connect Nepal to the world are actually quite uneven. Those flows are very strong in relation to the distance between Kathmandu and, say, the Gulf, or to, to the Philippines, where many girls go as domestic workers. But the education itself very much mirrors many of the ambitions and desires we have in Western education. So these kids are as, uh, uh, very mobile, but they're actually trapped in a particular part of the global economy. Okay, that was something that stimulated me a lot when I was working in Nepal. The other side of the Himalaya, I've been working in Tibet, in, in, China, in China for the last uh, 12 years, although I haven't, I haven't been doing that for the last 18 months or so. And believe it or not, I've been working there as part of a Danish development project, Danish government project, to introduce reform pedagogy in China. Okay, and most people think that's, that's uh, madness. Why would the Danes be doing that? But as, as Joseph was talking about this morning, the Chinese have, have quite a strong interest at the policy level in having a different type of education system. And there was a national curriculum reform, I think, in 2001 that was very much similar to the types of curriculum documents or visions you would find in the Scandinavian world about putting the learner at the center, encouraging creativity, encouraging kids to critique the teachers, to work in groups, to use local knowledge. All these things are enshrined in a curriculum document. What happens in practice is, is quite different depending on the parts of the country you're standing in. But in Tibet, what was interesting to me is that the national curriculum coming from Beijing was being implemented in the same way as other parts of China. But as you all know, Tibet has a particular, if not colonial, relation to, to the Chinese state. So there's a Chinese development process in, in that part of the world which is trying to give uh, Tibet certain levels of development but often means imposing a different cultural set of, a set of cultural values on Tibetans. And so it was interesting to me to see the way in which classrooms had been changing, individualizing, putting kids more in the center, but in the context of trying to make Chinese citizens and to think about what that does to young people's subjectivities. What types, of, what types of futures are they being prepared for, but how also do they see themselves? And that's been, on, that's been ongoing. That would be a typical, a typical um, um, uh, town school in rural, primarily rural China. In Denmark, we've had a long discussion now about what we can learn from China, and most of us would be able to, if we had time, most of us would be able to unpack certain things that we would see as typical of Chinese approaches to, to education. And we talked about some of those this morning, the gymnastic exercises that are part of every morning in China, which has an extra, an extra resonance when all the children and all the teachers are Tibetan. And they're doing this Chinese ritual in Chinese, in, in what is a Chinese school system. But there's also reforms that, that, make, young, that, make, uh, that, that, that uh, uh, make schools look very similar to what we see in parts of the developed West. And so part of the curriculum reforms have filtered down to the, the preschool level. And apart from some of the, the, the particularities of architecture and design, that could, be a, that could be a Western kindergarten in many ways. 
where I was working was really a long way out in the countryside in rural Tibet and the impact of Danish development assist assistance could possibly be seen in our particular approach to learner-centered teaching. So this was a particular Danish thing to encourage the teachers to put the kids in, in groups to get the kids to come up to the board and to be involved in negotiating what happens in the classes. That had never been done before in that part of China. And indeed it was only being done in schools that were being funded and supported by Danish development assistance. Many of the teachers here had never even heard of the national curriculum reform. Okay, in, in Lhasa, many of the teacher educators had never even heard of the reform. Never heard of it. When I first came there in 2001, we didn't know about it. But by 2004, the document was available in local bookshops. And we used to buy it to take to the teacher training college to show the colleagues what the central government had as an ambition. So, so what happens at the political level was often quite different at the grassroots level. And then the consequences of this was, was quite unpredictable in terms of what it would mean for young people's understanding of, of society. One thing that uh, Danish development workers became worried about eventually was that individualized young Tibetans were finding school much more interesting. Historically, Tibetans dropped out of school at a very early age. But with learner-centered pedagogy, kids found schooling more meaningful, they stayed longer, and that actually suited the interests of the Chinese government because they became Chinese subjects. They learned Han Chinese much better. They could get jobs in the local um, cash economy, the Chinese economy. So historically, these kids had dropped out of school, which many of their parents saw as a problem. The system saw it as a problem because that was both lost labor, but also potential political dissent. Do you get it? So, so getting kids to stay into school was one way, at least, the Chinese state could try and make Chinese citizens, which served a broader political purpose. That was interesting to me to try and study. And then I've also been, this is summer at campus at Roskilde, I've also been studying Danish higher education reform, very different topic. I don't have any other pictures and I struggled to think what I would actually show a picture of. But, and, and I think many of us have, have maybe forgotten what was the essence of the 2003 University Act. Some of you, of course, don't know. But um, I was particularly interested in studying how governance and decision-making arrangements changed when this law came in because the governing bodies of the universities were remade to, to, to have a different weight given to external members. Um, we got, for the first time, appointed stroke executive leaders at, at institutional and department level. St uh, uh, students were uh, written about much more as consumers, which at least the government had, had seen as a big, a big problem previously in Danish higher education. So with colleagues from um, the Danish University of Education in Copenhagen, Aarhus University now, we were studying how these reforms were playing out at the level of, of, of senior executives, institute leaders, and then students. So once again, thinking about the productive and the repressive consequences of global reforms that then take a particular um, character in a, in a locality, in a context. And all of that, in education policy studies, the, the way I've just described these three country cases is often wrapped up in the concept of globalization. That's become a very popular and convenient way to try and talk about global reform, uh, talk about international education reforms that cut across boundaries, that travel. And I think most of you will know, will know these categories, um, and I'm not going to talk about those no, now. In educational policy studies, it's almost, uh, almost solely the political, the economic, and the cultural that scholars talk about. And uh, what troubled me was that most educational policy scholars would conflate or reduce all of these down to economics. So ultimately, globalization was driven by economic changes. And if you, leave, if you read the Anglo-American literature on policy studies, it'll often uh, even boil that down further to neoliberalism. Okay? And of course, no one would deny the role of economics in all of these social changes. But I was, I was looking at the ways in which young people in particular were being subjectivized in the state through schooling, but also by cultural changes that were in many ways disconnected from the places where they lived. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. So for me, I found this unhelpful, and then I tried to think about uh, different ways to conceptualize or to visualize globalization. And these are just some of them. I use the word uh, imaginaries, which uh, uh, Arjuna Padurai uses. I'll come back to him in a moment. But these are some different ways one could think about globalization before operationalizing it as empirical study. 
and there are undoubtedly others. Um, and I'm not going to race through um, all the names, but I think I have four different ways that you could think about globalization as phenomena. Okay? One would be, I think, the one that we're most familiar with are processes that may have uh, stemmed or orig originated in, in North, North, Northern Europe, maybe the Anglo-American world, and then are now spreading you know, through Asia, through South America, and so forth. Um, processes of modernization that, that, that um, take form as intensifications in a spreading of what we have experienced ourselves, the same modern story. Anthony Giddens, Ulrich Beck, um, are particular examples from sociology. Some of you will know Thomas Friedman was a different type of literature, but he wrote a book called, uh, now I've forgotten the name, but Flat, something is the world flat. It was a, is the world flat? Yeah. And that was, in some sense, a very triumphant statement about the opportunities that were now available because of globalization. It leveled the playing field. Yeah, so companies in, in North America could have, a, could have a factory in Bangalore, reduce a lot of costs, and, and if you were educated and prepared for that, globalization was a world of opportunity. So it's quite normative. Um, Another more nuanced version is that from Apatari and Manuel Castells, which would say that these processes are happening, but they're uneven. So modernization is something is a dynamic that can't be stopped, but it takes different forms in different parts of the world. Another way would be to think of, think of it in terms of what um, uh, Samuel Eisenstadt calls multiple modernities. So Nepal won't necessarily um, repeat the story we've been through since the mid-1900s, It'll take another, another version based on the relations it already has with certain parts of the world, which for the most part are structured around exploitation. Apatari talks about how India's route to globalization can't be disconnected from its colonial past, which gives opportunities as well as constraints about how it will modernize. And then another a third type was, would, would be uh, to see modernity as something um, that's uh, falling apart, unraveling. And I think the best example of that is Emmanuel Wallerstein, who talks about um, globalization as just the last, uh, the, yeah, the last phase of global capitalism. And because global, as you all know, global capitalism from that Marxist perspective has built into it uh, uh, contradictions which will eventually, eventually lead to its collapse. Wallerstein is quite depressed about what globalization means, but ultimately sees it as something that will, will end up unraveling. And a new world, he doesn't know what the next world order will look like, but this, this phase of modernity will end at some point. Others, others sort of build on the Friedman approach, but have a much more scholarly version of this unraveling. Michael Hart and Antoni, Antonio Negri wrote a really great book called Empire in 2000, where they tried to argue that these processes of, processes of globalization would end up leading to the system, the imperial centers, if you like, whether it's Wall Street or London or whatever, collapsing because of the inter, what they called the interconnectivity of the multitude, the people who had otherwise been dispossessed by globalization, by modernity, sorry, would become connected by globalization. We, we, we're seeing the start of that with grassroots movements that connect across time and space. So often, often grassroots roots movements in, say, Latin America don't need to go up the food chain in a vertical way to... Uh, to uh, 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 confront their own governments, they can draw on other grassroots movements in other parts of the world and have a broader movement that governments need to respond to. And Hart and Negri saw that as the biggest potential for globalization leading to some form of emancipation for the people that had otherwise been left behind by modernization. And then finally, another, another lot uh, doesn't really give any direction. Zygmunt Bauman, most of you will know, has written a lot about a lot. So it's hard to find a thread in his work but one of, one of the themes in his work is, is about how globalization just leaves people behind. He wrote a short, very provocative book called Wasted Lives about how people in the so-called global south, for the most part, are being left behind by globalization. They don't necessarily have any future. And that's, what, that's one way to understand the rise of political conflict in certain countries that are disconnected from these global flows. Nepal is an, an obvious example. When people can't see a way up the, the path to modernity, they'll find, they'll find ways to, to confront the whole system. And um, James Ferguson, an American anthropologist, uh, did, a, did a big ethnography of 
um, uh, uh, young men in Zambia working in and around the copper belt in the 80s and no the 90s. And he tried to show how um, people moving to the city on the back of higher copper prices, a, a, a boom in the, in the local economy, led to a cosmopolitan identity. But when the copper price collapsed, they all needed to go back home to the village and renegotiate roles in so-called traditional society. So globalization, or that phase of modernity, was an opportunity to make them cosmopolitan, but then was taken away. And that explains a lot of the, the unrest in, in some sub-Saharan uh, sub countries that experienced quite a, quite a rapid modernization in the 60s and 70s and then got left behind. So they're, they're, they're different types of imaginaries, um, all of which could be filled out as a program. And I found I, I could see similarities in all of my empirical work. But then, but then, I, then I started reading um, a, a short but very provocative book um, by a Padurai, Arjuna Padurai, called Modernity at Large, which I think was from uh, 1996, mid, the mid-90s. And this, this is often crit criticized as one of the first wave of globalization books, one that was very optimistic about globalization, um, but criticized because it didn't really, um, it didn't really uh, problematize the state. It, did, it didn't really um, uh, theorize power in the, in the global economy. But in short, uh, this, is, this, this is key for my own work, and it's key for why I've put together three studies that in the field of comparative education would simply not be allowed to be put together. It's apples, oranges, and bananas, in a sense. I've studied um, teacher training in China, higher education, management reform in higher education in Denmark, and basic and primary education in Nepal. So three different types of countries, three different levels of the education systems in those countries, okay? So it's a real mashup of different types of things, but that was deliberate. I didn't, I didn't design those three studies as, one, as part of a coherent program. Over time, I saw how they connected and spoke to each other. And then I deliberately put them together to make an experiment just to try and shake up my own field of comparative education. All right? But Apatari talks about how in the global cultural economy, the state, the, the, the fundamental point, I think, is that the state has been dislodged or moved from being, the, being at the center doesn't mean that the state has disappeared, but the state no longer governs social life in a country. We all know that from economic flows, um, from policy flows. We know that in Denmark, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But this, this is an important point, that we had to reconceptualize the state. Another was that we have built into empirical work the tendency to slow down objects that are actually in motion. You know, which, especially in comparative anthropology is, is, is a classic example of that. In order to study something, we need to write about it and describe it. Often in the history of at least anthropology, these become codified as what someone once called museum studies of a place. So that if I was going to send students to Nepal, they would probably read some of my writing and other Anglo-American writing that may have been written in the 80s, the 70s, the 90s. And it starts to solidify objects that are actually highly dynamic and changing all the time. And he said that globalization only increased that dynamism. So it was a problem when we study globalization to try and study things that are constantly moving and constantly becoming. Our tendency and our need is to slow them down, if you like, take photographs of them that we can hold on to and then describe. That was a provocation to me. The third, the third thing was that he used a concept from Deleuze, uh, which he then sort of uh, moved away from, of deterritorialization and re-territorialization. So he said the global processes could all be categorized by this movement towards things being decentered, unstable, then, re then becoming stable again briefly, possibly around what we used to call culture, could be around the capitalist mode of production, could be anything, depending on the, the example. But things would break down, um, move, and then settle. But it was always a temporary process. So things would never be like they used to be. The way we talked about the nation, about growing up in a society, about certain values, our Padurai's point was that was highly problematic if we take seriously what globalization means. As the state no longer in charge, and as things in flux. 
And of course, I, I'm sure many of you could already understand that that, that is, is a problematic view, but he tried to unpack it by, by using this imagery of escape. And I guess you can easily, you can connect that to a landscape most, most readily. And he deliberately didn't use the word landscape, but that imagery was tr to try and give you a way of thinking about the new landscapes in globalization. Ethno would simply mean the mobility. What characterizes uh, one part of this, one part of the current era, epoch of modernity is, is, is a great deal of mobility of different ethnic groups. Okay, that wasn't there before. Uh, media, technology, finance, you could imagine for yourselves, I imagine. But then ide Ideoscape was the one that I worked most with. And he said, um, he tried to argue that globalization was characterized mainly by the flow of ideas that were disconnected from political projects in particular countries. So a good example would be the Arab Spring. Okay, what started as a single protest in Tunisia is still playing out in Syria. And it's interesting in Syria because no one knows what it will mean for Iran and therefore for Israel and therefore for American hegemony in the Middle East and the oil economy and the whole world order. And those things, uh, Paderai tries to argue, uh, without giving country cases, those things were easier to control before the age of global flows, global media, inter uh, telecommunications and so forth, and the spread of ideas. Okay? And that's a challenge. That's a challenge for nation states who are trying to manage society through something like education. But it's equally a challenge for, for researchers who try to study things in contexts. So these global flows, uh, he's often crit uh, criticized a bit like Friedman for thinking these, these flows uh, are straightforward. For example, labor markets in the Gulf simply tap into resources in Kathmandu and it's a straight exchange. He would, he would say that that's, that may be the, I guess, the motorway, the freeway that's been connected between those countries. But what actually takes place in practice is highly dependent on the context so, for example, there's been many, many studies of, of um, um, and we talked about this with Indian colleagues, of, of migrant workers returning from the Middle East with different understandings of the, um, the formal economy, of rights, of the use of technology, mobile phones, accessing government information and so forth, even coming home with, with, with US dollars that they can go into a village and buy land that was historically denied them because of their, their caste or their class status. So these flows are actually quite unpredictable. What looks like simply a, in that case, simply an exa a, a, a way for, uh, for, for surplus labor in a country like Nepal to be satisfied elsewhere will end up unraveling as maybe political dissent in Kathmandu, change family and social relations in the villages. All of those things were quite unpredictable. And then finally, a bit like Hart and Negri, he was saying that if, if the state is no longer at the center and has to be reconceptualized, then logically that means the periphery, the edge and the center are connected in different ways. And that's an empirical challenge for researchers to try and understand. And that will be different in different contexts. So what does all that mean um, for my field? Um, and that's what I'll, I wanted to get at here. Um, a Paderai's book, um, I mean, I guess it would be, it'd be great in the commentaries with, with, if Joseph could give his impression of how that book was received in America in the 90s and then later on. But um, most anthropologists I've talked to and the writing that I've read about a Paderai's book is largely negative. It will start by saying this is an interesting way to reconceptualize things, but the state is still the main player. Power is under-theorized. There's no theory of gender. When you talk about mobility, it's, it's far too general and it's not, it's not, there's no nuance. And therefore, it may, may have some programmatic value, but it's, it's, um, it's overheated, if not hysterical, if not, if not um, too triumphant about, about the new world order that may emerge from these global flows. And I found, I found the book interesting because it enabled me to connect my studies, but also because he used what most people would accept was a postmodern a concept from Deleuze, this deterritorialization and re-territorialization re re has built into it an understanding that things can only ever become, right? They can never just be. Globalization has meant that
that even, even if it was a time when things were static and stable, if that's true, that may be an in, in intensely managed fiction amongst researchers, but even if things were stable, they're now no longer stable because of globalization. And Deleuze's theory was a way to try and um, disrupt what he thought was the, the taken for grantedness in anthropology of going to places and studying phenomena and being able to say things with authority, particularly about culture. And in my field, that problem, um, which in, I think anthropology had been dealt with with, with quite a, a degree of sophistication, was quite naively dealt with in, edu in, in comparative education because the state remained in the center. Okay, so, so it interested me that, uh, that uh, Apadurai was speaking to me quite directly, but those postmodern ideas in Apadurai had been uh, marginalized, basically seen as not practical, empirically, empirically unjustifiable, and therefore basically pushed, to aside, pushed aside in favor of doing uh, more grounded work in an area studies tradition and going back to Marxist origins. Apadurai himself was in Copenhagen, uh, I think last month or the month before. I told him what I was working on, and I asked him why he wasn't taking his book further. And he, he, he laughed and said he got so badly beaten up in his own field that he then decided to go back to what he was good at, which was analyzing the globalization from a Marxist starting point, not necessarily an end point, but a Marxist starting point with global inequality at the center, and, and a focus on area studies. And I told him that I thought that was a, a lack of ambition given what he had opened up. But he looked very disturbed that I had actually taken his book like a Bible and was going off doing empirical work based on it because it was something he was backing away from. And now in my own field, um, and I put this here simply because I think you all have your own disciplinary fields, students are also trying to negotiate lots of ideas, theoretical ideas, about, about, about a, 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 um, a concept, whether it's youth or school or family or whatever. In my field, you don't need to read the detail, okay? Please, it'll take, it'll take all day. But that's a typical map I think most, most um, uh, uh, scholars would try to make, even in their minds, if not as a, as a cartographic exercise, but trying to locate themselves, okay? Trying to locate where they are themselves. And you don't need to, to understand all that. I think the main point is, I think you could vulgarize this by saying there, there's a, 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 a tradition that's highly connected to, to narratives from, from modern modernity. In this department, Habermas is important, Marx is important, Durkheim and so forth, those, those sort of things there that in educational studies often then get used to, to, to establish control okay, over, the, over the empirical world. So you go out into a school and you're relatively comfortable because you've already decided that class is a major category. Right? It's a form of control. At the other end would be postmodern, they call it destabilization, but it could be unframing, simply, simply, simply refusing to allow your empirical work to be driven by a particular concept. And then, and then, try, and then being uh, cautious about developing any meta-narrative any single explanatory uh, uh, position. And then at the top, he calls it systems. You could say structure. And at the bottom, you could have individual or phenomenological approach. So I think that axis is not a bad way for students to start understanding the conceptual world between things that can be controlled and understood, things that either can't or shouldn't, structures, and then, then uh, an individualized or a phenomenological approach to, to phenomena. And in my field of, edu of, of comparative education, I would say all of this diversity um, is basically lacking. My field is probably here because comparative education historically has been about understanding differences in educational traditions and systems in order to inject new ideas into one's own. So it's already had a scientific logic. Um, and I think our department, our department now, uh, the department at, at Roskilde is quite diverse. At times it was probably able, you, you were probably able to find a center of gravity. Now we have more colleagues that are sort of pulling that center of gravity in different directions. Okay, but in my field, um, a padarai was, a, was an extra challenge because this idea of becoming, of not being able to stabilize things that are moving actually spoke against the whole tradition of comparative education, which could be summarized 
by a diagram like that, which most of us would know, that if you want to study more than one country, you'll need to find certain variables. Once again, you don't need to understand these. In this example, as different aspects of, the, of, of education society, curriculum, teaching methodologies, the management system and so forth, break it down by different groups within a, within a country, and then uh, locations within, uh, within the world system and then down to the individual in the classroom. And most comparative work has been involved in, in, in not, maybe not isolating, but being very clear about these variables and then comparing like with like. Okay? And that's a long tradition. It's not the only tradition. But it's a long tradition in comparative education. And that's what I wanted to destabilize through using a padurai and trying to work with these different cases in different countries. And it's not the only way, it's not the only way comparative education works. But let me give you three examples of the best work in my field, which I think nevertheless still falls short. And it still, it still suffers from the same dilemma that a padurized work has, because there's no space in a field like policy studies for what you would call postmodern or post-classical destabilizations. There's just no space for that. Because by definition, education policy studies is about understanding and changing. So my wife says I'm simply in the wrong field, and it would be just easier to go to another field than to keep plowing this, this area. But I think, I think comparative education is ripe for different types of theories and techniques. But here are three good examples that get beyond that cube, okay? that sort of uh, breaking down and at atomizing of, of uh, social phenomena that are actually in, in high motion. One would be a vertical case study where you would study different parts of a system or many systems. And that would, that would de de depend on the research questions and object. So um, and, uh, I've, I've certainly studied what happens in, a, in, a, in a, uh, a national ministry and then how district education officers understand or misunderstand that and then what it means for teachers. Underway, you may decide, well, it's not actually coming from the ministry. It's coming from the World Bank. And that may be an extra level in the vertical study. But nevertheless, the problem with that, it's not the cube, but it's got a cube logic to it. That uh, contrary to a padurai with the breakdown of this center and periphery distinction, you can, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a, a sense in which people think they can put a boundary around an object, the classroom. If you take a padurai seriously, you'd have to acknowledge that even young people, maybe not in preschool, but youth in particular, are connected to global flows of ideas, dispositions, values, that are disconnected from the countries they live in. It doesn't mean they become North American youth when they're in Kathmandu. But it would be far too simplistic to say a Kathmandu youth has a Kathmandu value and cultural set because they're now connected in different ways than they were before. So putting these boundaries here is highly problematic. Another way, which is sort of the, the origin of many of these concepts, comes from a very distinguished American anthropologist, George Marcus. And he developed the idea of multi-site ethnography as one practical way to deal with this problem of globalization. Okay? And so he thought, rather than, rather than this sort of a food chain idea of top to bottom, he thought maybe the best way to understand, I guess, um, understand, in my case, a classroom in Zambia would be to, to explore a classroom in Nepal and a classroom in Denmark for the same type of object in different cultural contexts and then work out which variables seem to be determining in different, in different contexts. Once again, there's still a boundary logic to that, okay? which fits very well in comparative education because we want boundaries, because we want to be able to control, because we want to be able to come with information that will change practice, which may or may not have much to do with social reality. And then finally, I mentioned the study I was doing uh, in higher education reform in Denmark. We, we, we've, I've been working with Susan Wright in, at Aarhus University, and she's developed a, a new field called the anthropology of policy. So rather than, rather than be beholden to, different, to particular places or sites or objects, she's she, she, her idea is that, is that one could follow a policy. And so we followed the University Act from 2003 and tried to see how that changed as it traveled from the, from the parliament or even before the parliament when there were hearings about what should be done with the problem of Danish higher education, we followed that process, then followed the initial policy, and then saw how that policy took, took, took form as practice in different institutions. 
okay? And how that was influenced by different other factors, academics traveling, uh, UNESCO reports, and so forth. So they, they are three ways, but nevertheless held on to something of this bounded idea of space. And I don't have that much time, but I think um, people often ask me or say, well, it's easy enough to deconstruct and critique all of these other good efforts, but what have I been able to manage myself? And there's different things, and I'll only talk about these briefly. Padurai, in many of his writings, uh, talked about uh, two potential ways forward. One was to study multiple flows in multiple places. He thought that was probably more, more, a, a, a more accurate picture of the global condition, that in any one place, it's already connected to other places, but by very different types of flows. So the Arab Spring example in Tunisia was a thing about getting access to markets and to government, partly backed by a rights discourse, but also backed by some certain ideas of consumer modernity and individualism that young people have. It's very difficult just to say it's political protest because what young people in, in, in the Arab world are embodying is a right to self-determination, a right to be a consumer, a different relation to the state. They also have traditions. It's a complicated set of, uh, of, of flows. So you could explore multiple flows in, in uh, multiple spaces or multiple flows in a single space. And with Ulla Madsen, my colleague, we've had uh, three different types of studies. The first one is the one I, I called a policy scape, and that's where I, temp I attempted to bring together the three studies I talked about. The second is one we're still working on, and Ulla's doing some writing at the moment, and when that's finished, we'll try and uh, work that up into an English book that has a similar ambition, but this time to particularly look at youth in and around schooling in South Korea, Zambia, and Denmark. Once again, three entirely different types of countries. Okay, but for us, um, Denmark could be seen in the center. We have a certain relation to Africa. We understand uh, our position in the world partly by our benevolence through development to Africa that enables Danes to develop a, a certain image of themselves, often not a very pleasant one, but we also have an attitude towards the high income societies in, in, in Asia, as, uh, a sort of catch up idea. So there's sort of a, a sense of superiority with the developing world and a sense of fear with the, with the rapidly uh, modernizing Asian world. And we tried to put that into a, into a I guess, a, 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 a dialogue. And then Ulla and I have been studying in Nepal for many years how young people have contested schooling. So there are three different ways to try and mix up this, this um, understanding of, of the state and, and, and the flows of certain things. Just to finish, I've, I've worked with, in, in the first one, the educational policy scape. The important thing for me was to try and find ways to connect those three studies. What did they have in common? And I've argued and written about how even, those society, even, those, even though those three societies are quite different, they all share a certain governing logic now, okay, between a certain type of individualism and advanced individual logic, liberal logic, Education for All as a national movement is an example of that, which is not necessarily connected to neoliberalism as an economic movement. But there are these liberalizing processes that connect all three countries. And for my case, across Denmark, the west of China and Nepal, I'm able to find policies and practices that are quite common across those three places. And just to give, I mean, I think I spoke about that, that in order to compare these uh, apples, oranges, and bananas. You can see here my three countries, three different, three different levels or, or focuses, and then empirical objects, the university law, the boards of universities, certain university contract mentality that came in the Danish system. In Nepal, I looked at community schooling, okay, and looked at the role of parents and school management committees. And in China, it was curriculum reform. So I tried to find out how I could, how I could work with all those together but of course, that would be an endless process to try and describe all of that, okay? Just to in describe empirically what's happening in all these countries and then try and come to a conclusion. So it was theory driven and I had, I had these three concepts. Before I even started thinking about joining them together, I had these three concepts which I introduced at the start. How is the state being reformed? If, if you take seriously what Apadurai was talking about, about globalization, how can we understand the new role of the state under global conditions? 
The state hasn't disappeared, but it's changed, and it's different in different societies. So I would, and, and, then, and then how can people act? Given, given uh, the, tech, the, the four imaginaries of globalization, one of which included people being excluded and just left behind, another included the empire idea of people connecting and then bringing down global capitalism, two extremes. How can you, how can you understand the possibilities for social action under global conditions? And then finally, I think the most difficult, which um, perhaps anthropologists have come to deal with or to avoid or to find a way to work with, but educationists are hopelessly implicated, and that's the idea of culture. How do you work with place or locality? How do you acknowledge that things actually happen in a particular place, but it may be essentialist to call that culture? How do you actually conceptualize what we all know as culture? if things no longer originate in places. They manifest in places, but they don't necessarily come from places anymore. That was at least the argument that Apatari was putting. And so in my empirical work, I tried to find these ways to work with those, those concepts in order to fill them again. And so I've written a lot about how the state is, is, is clearly still an important player in all three countries. Okay? In the, I, th I would say in China, the state still mediates a great deal of social life, not all, but a great deal, and there's a quite a, a lot of control from the center. Okay, and that's that's a big story to unpack. In Nepal, the lack of state apparatus, right, means that many global reforms never get past Kathmandu. They rarely get out of the ministry. We used to we used to joke as consultants that the reports we would write would would be used for a week, and then they'd sit on they'd sit on a shelf. They wouldn't even get out of the ministry, let alone, let alone down to the level of the classroom. So I, I tried to develop this typology, which is very weak in a, in, a, in a way, between strong states and weak states, because that was, a, that was a language used in development, between strong and weak and fragile and failing. So I tried to turn that back onto development um, policy itself to give the examples of, say, Denmark, which by all accounts would be a strong state, but acts quite weakly because it's signed up to almost everything in terms of education reforms coming from Europe. Okay? So in, 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 in governance theory, you would look upon Denmark as a very strong st space that controls a lot of its own policies. But these policies are things that are already reflected in a broader European discussion about how to organize social life. So in fact, Danes don't decide, describe, decide very much, at least at the higher education level. At, 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 the, at the compulsory school, I think it's a different picture. But I would argue there's no such thing as a Danish higher education policy. I've never seen it. There's particular practices in Danish institutions that may give you a sign to what is local. Well, that, that's, a, that's an indication of locality and may give you hints at what we used to call culture. There's certain practices that are clearly different from what happens in England or Germany. Um, and the state has different capacity to reach in and reach out. So I think in, 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 in China, um, we talked about this this morning, even though the state is quite strong and controls what comes in, it simply doesn't have the resources, and I would say the willpower, to control what happens right at the local level. So we, we, well, I was mentioning in relation to the curriculum reform in China, a learner-centered curriculum, all teachers in China were, were trained to be learner-centered teachers, and for the most part, that took the form of a two-week lecture-based course, okay, which is highly ironic that the state had a commitment at the national level to a different vision of education, but didn't have the, the understanding, or I would say the willpower or the resources to actually enable teachers to embody that new ideology. And then action. I was really interested in, in this whole area of what, what can be done under global conditions. If some people are saying it's hopeless, modernity is just going to race on and marginalize and alienate people, others are saying it's a great opportunity to overturn the capitalist system. What happens in different places? And so in the three studies, I've showed different possibilities. In some cases, um, old voices have become much more dominant. Globalization, as it takes form in Nepal, has simply em embodied district education officers. You know, the NIDA, the Danish Development Agency, can't run schools. We've given that power to local, local authorities, and they've gone and done what they've always done. But now with the extra mandate of the country having signed up to global, global declarations about what should be done, 
So some people have been huge winners in Nepal. Okay. Um, in Denmark, you could argue who, you, that would be an interesting discussion, that if, if higher education is now part of a global space but takes a particular form in this locality, who have been the winners and losers? On the one hand, some, many students say they have a stronger voice now. They, can actually, they actually know who they can complain to. They actually feel as customers they have more rights for materials being put on the internet, for teaching being good quality and so forth. On the other hand, other students will say, we used to always be part of a democratic community. And now that's been institutionalized through committees and management that we feel much more distant. So that's an empirical question to try and study. So they were the three categories, and I tried to fill these out, all as a way to try and work with what Apatari was talking about, but at the same time, try and destabilize, destabilize comparative education as a discipline. And if I can use a couple of minutes, then I would say, how would I destabilize that? Because one critique is that even though I tried to combine very different countries, okay, I ended up doing, to some extent, parallel studies and then comparing at the last minute. And that's always been the tradition in comparative education. It's simply not possible. I've never, not found a human way to be in three places at the one time and then to be working across those things dialectically at the same time. So we tend, as brains, cogn cognitive systems, to have to be in a place then finish there and be in another place and finish there and so forth. And it's been very difficult for me to find out empirically how you work across sites and see the ways in which they invest each other with concepts and ideas and subjective positions. Um, another would be that even though I had this ambition to get beyond comparative education uh, traditions, I ended up with the same old, the same old um, topics, the state, power, and culture. And, and, and I deliberately did that as a way to try and address those and to, and to unframe and make them more nuanced. But I was also criticized for simply doing the same thing but using a lot of fancy anthropological language. Okay. And Ulla, Ulla, my colleague, the book we'll be writing is of a very different nature when we're talking about young people's subjectivities across the, the, the global north and south. But she, she's, she always saw my work as simply a, another example, another appropriation of a modern way of thinking. It may have some inspirations that were postmodern, but just like a Padurai, I ended up for lots of institutional power political reasons picking categories that were safe and secure within my discipline and simply t reworking them a little. Okay? So she encouraged me in our next writing to go far beyond that. Um, and what we might do, and this is, this is the, the, the end, what we might do, what we could do, which would give an entirely different understanding of at least what I've done so far, would be to try and work with, with theories and concepts that simply avoid the state as the organizing logic at least in my field, educational sociology since Hegel has been completely dominated by the state at the center. It's almost not possible to read and do educational sociology without having this image of the state as the, as the major mediating force. Okay? And that's because the state is a real thing. But there's an interesting discussion about whether we imagine the state as being at the center or it's actually a pre-existing reality in many of the studies I've done, people have had no connection to the state. Three or four kilometers out of Lhasa, you will not find the state. And even in local schools that haven't had curriculum reform, it's really difficult to find the Chinese state beyond slogans on the walls. You know, people in Nepal would say the same. As soon as you get a few kilometers off the main roads in the hills, the state becomes a very loose organizing concept. But if you look at anthropological and educational studies research on Nepal, the state is the framing logic. And maybe that should be not taken for granted. There's a great discussion. I, I mentioned this concept of the multitude that came from Hart and Negri. That was a way to reinvigorate Marxism. Okay? So rather than say class, the working class would organize, the global multitude that had been isolated and left behind would organize. So Hart and Negri's book was actually a political statement that globalization wouldn't lead to revolution, but it would give the conditions through grassroots movements for people to come together and to make a different type of world. Jean Baudrillard takes the entirely different view, saying, you know, building from critical theory, saying that what we now have is not a multitude that still have political potential, but we have a mass 
who both are uh, impervious, unable, unable to take in messages, and not particularly concerned about giving messages back. You know, as long as they've got a car and a swimming pool and a job, they won't necessarily be politically active. And for much of his writing, he's tried to understand social action without thinking in a pre-existing way about people organizing the social. And I know in my work, I've taken it for granted that human beings have a strong social component. We would probably all agree with that. But is that, a, is that an empirical fact or is that a prejudice we have? And how, how is that different in different contexts? And I think the most difficult thing is how we, how we um, uh, think about place and space um, as, as, uh, uh, as uh, the place where we do research and the origin of, of social action. Okay? And that's, once again, another way to try and uh, to, uh, to deal with the culture concept, but to not have an essentialist starting point and not be, not be predisposed or committed to, certain, to looking for certain cultural characteristics. It's bad anthropology, and I've been part of that early on, to go to Nepal, for example, already with a very clear idea of caste as the organizing category within a state that only supports certain understanding of caste, but within a critical theory or emancipatory logic that if only that could be overturned, the world could be different. And they're all Western, they're all Western uh, philosophical assumptions that, of course, we see in practice, but it's an interesting discussion about to what extent they exist in practice and to what extent they are projections of a particular Western intellectual heritage. All of that stuff, I think, I've mainly been inspired by, by my colleague, Ulla Madsen, who, who finds her own literature to deal with this. But I think in the next stage, I could easily be writing about my policyscape study and turn the whole thing around. And hopefully, I think the conclusion would be that there's not a conclusion, that these processes, these processes of global interconnectivity only can ever be seen as processes of becoming. Certain things will solidify. It may be oppression. It may be neoliberal management. Certain things will become clear to see. But that too will move on and change. And so the work, the work that I'm, I was, uh, now the boss, the boss is gone. So this was partly a, 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 an address to the boss to give me a little more research time. But um, the, the, books, the book that Ulla and I will write will probably, be, will probably have this book as a starting point, which was a foundational text in, in comparative education. I won't explain anything more than ask you to remember the cube. Okay? But that cube logic was central to, to turning comparative education into a, a science. And then this morning we, sorry, this morning we mentioned um, Robin Alexander's book on, on culture and pedagogy where he tried to explore educational culture, classroom culture in five different countries in order to find similarities and differences. That was an enormous, enormous empirical uh, project that took many, many years and big teams of researchers. We won't be doing that, but we're certainly studying uh, young people in context across societies in order to see what can be common. And then finally, um, Joseph's own book is something that we've used a lot in methodological terms because part of our current study has been um, uh, following Danish young people in secondary schools as they go to different countries on what's called cultural meeting visits. And when they've gone to Zambia and South Korea and Beijing, Ulla has followed them. She's been with them for these weeks, lived with them, and then talked to them as they've engaged with the so-called other, which was the object of the study visit. And we've tried to use that, not with, not multi, not with multivocal ethnography, but we've tried to create conditions where uh, young people themselves will generate data and comment on data. And all of those together with something uh, beyond a modern philosophical foundation will be the ambition for what we're going to work on in the next two or three years. And I'll stop there. <laughs>